Hello everyone, this is Mayank Bansal. I uh, work in a data info group at Uber and I'm co-presenting with my colleague, uh, Bo Yang. He's also working data info at Uber. Here we are to present ZS, Uber's highly scalable and distributed software as a service. For Uber, um, we are a global company. We are 15 billion trips. We completed our 15 billion trips. Uh, we are 18 million trips per day. We are in six continents. We are in 69 countries and 10,000 cities. Uh, we have 103 million active monthly users and 5 million active drivers. Um, so data and ML um, actually is the um, backbone for Uber to do a lot of stuff. Uh, there are a lot of use cases which uses data and ML platforms and uh, and provide user experience. Uh, the many of them like Uber Eats, ETA, self-driving vehicles, forecasting maps, there are many. I'm gonna talk about few in the next few slides. So um, ETAs, right? So ETA is a very important uh, uh, use case for Uber. So when you open an app, you see my cars are uh, three minutes away. And when you click, um, uh, uh, right, then it will probably give you a route and it will give you a, a time that how much time this will take. All these things comes from the ETA functionality. ETAs are generated by root-based algorithms. There are many, many models, ML models, which crunches lot of, lot of, lots of data and produce uh, these ETAs. <clears throat> and these ETAs are the, the, if there is any error in the ETS, those take as a feedback and then again be processed on the next rights, right? So this is very, very important use case and it's been powered by ML and data platforms. So the next use case, I'll talk about the driver rider match. So um, once you open an app and then uh, you click you know, the ride, then there is a, a demand and a supply, right? And then people, uh, so then uh, actually, uh, at the runtime, uh, machine learning models predict if you're gonna make a ride, uh, if you're gonna make a ride, what are, the, what are the cars which are nearby you, and then they match between rider and driver. And that's all been driven by ML and data platforms. Uh, so this is very, very important use case for Uber. The another uh, line of business Uber have, which is Uber Eats, which is growing very fast given this. Um, uh, uh, so we all the eats functionality is being driven by data and ML models. The models used for ranking of the restaurants, delivered delivering times, search ranking. There are hundreds and hundreds of models which gets load, which gets predicted and renders eats homepage. Uh, when what are the uh, different dishes you want to like? What are the uh, so the eats. Um, apps and the mo um, models predict that. And this has been run at the runtime and then they train the model from the data and ML platforms. So this has been a very, very big use case for Uber for data and ML. So there is another very interesting use case is self-driving car. So we have, Uber has a self-driving car unit. Uh, we, where we, where are we trying to uh, make self-driving cars and the software for that. So for that, we need, a, very, very big data and ML models to predict the routes, to predict the signs, to predict the pedestrians, uh, and <clears throat> and then visualize the whole path, right? So this is a big, very big use case, I will say, for data and ML platforms. So I'll, let's talk about a little bit on um, what how Uber's data stacks look like. So there are TL data lakes. Um, we have in-memory databases like Pino and AlexDB, and then we use HDFS for this hot and warm storage. And then we have the archival for the disaster recovery purposes, which we do it in the cloud. On the left side, we see there are mobile event app events, and there are which comes from your apps, device telemetry, device information, microservices events, database events, third-party feeds, and so there are a lot of lots of events which comes, uh, which are being emitted in the Uber stack. Um, so there is a, so all these events pipe through Kafka and then they go to the tier data lake. 
then there is a compute fabric on top of this tier data lake, which is uh, yarn and mesos uh, and plus peloton. So we have this peloton internal spiruler. Uh, so we use yarn and mesos plus peloton as a compute fabric for the whole uh, Uber. And these uh, compute fabric powers uh, steam processing like Flink. Flink mostly run on yarn. And then batch processing, where most of the Spark applications, Taze, MapReduce, all these things runs on top of this compute fabric. On top of it, there is a real-time pre-aggregated query engines. There is ad hoc query engines, and there is a complex batch query engines. Pre-aggregated real-time query engines are Athena X, ad hoc interactive Presto Vertica, and then there is a Hive query engine on top. <clears throat> On top of it, we use many BI uh, and analytics tools and dashboards. So we have this Piper, UWork, which is uh, 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 work, uh, which is our uh, workflow engine. And then we have these dashboards built on top of it. Then there are ad hoc queries, which we run on Query Builder, as well as there are tools like DSW and Tableau. Um, so uh, now let's talk about the Uber's ML stack. So we, you know, there are many stages of Uber for uh, machine learning, right? Uh, when there is a data preparation, which we use uh, stream processing. Uh, for stream processing, we use Flink, which powers through Kafka, all the events come through Kafka. And for the batch processing, the events, uh, we use Hive Spark, Hive on Spark and Spark um, and Hive on Taze. And these things come from data lake from HTFS. Uh, once data preparation is done, then we do start going prototyping. Prototyping, we you mostly use Jupyter Notebooks and Spark Magic. For the training, we use a lot of um, technologies like TensorFlow, PyTorch, Xzibus, Spark ML, right? So we train the model and then at the real-time prediction for inference, we use real-time prediction service for the real-time inference and then for batch prediction jobs also. We have uh, feature store, model store, and metric store. And this is all part of a Michelangelo platform, which is our ML platform at Uber. So let's talk about Apache Spark at Uber. So uh, Apache Spark is a primarily, uh, primarily analytics execution engine, uh, which we use at Uber. Most of the batch applications or most of the batch workloads, which is like 95% of the batch workloads run on top of Apache Spark. Uh, Apache Spark runs of Yarn and Peloton and Mesos, both. We use, uh, and for the ex for Shuffle, we use external Shuffle service uh, in both of the platforms. Let's talk about how uh, external Shuffle sub service works in few uh, words. Um, so we all know we have a mapper and the reducers. Mapper runs under the executors. Once mapper tries to uh, put some data onto the disk or the map output, they create some partitions. And those partitions was written uh, through two lo local disk in some files through local shuffle service, right? This is what this diagram shows on top of it. And then once, you, once a reducer task wants to re uh, read all the mapper output, the reducer task will go to each machine where it knows where, where the mapper ran. And then reduce a task will read each and every mapper and for one partition and then aggregate all the data at the reducer side and produce outputs based on the business logic, right? This is how um, <clears throat> whole uh, shuffle uh, paradigm or whole shuffle service works, uh, where shuffle service has been uh, for writing the data, mapper writes the data, and reducers read the data through shuffle service, right? So there are some challenges um, by using external shuffle service, and some of them are uh, uh, here. So one is the SSD wearing out issue. Um, the what happens is we are using SSDs on our uh, compute fabric, and uh, the and the problem is uh, there is a concept in SSDs which is called DWPD, and which is mostly one. What it means is you can write and read from the disk uh, one times a day. However, uh, uh, in our in Uber, we have so much workloads. So we actually write around 3.5x or 4x times a day, the whole disk, which actually reduces the life of the disk to uh, one third or one fourth, right? So the disk, which should be bad within three to four years is actually getting bad eight to 12 months. 
so that is a big issue we had to uh, so we have to keep on changing the ssds or um, disks or replace the hardware so that's a big cost for us so this is one of the major issue which we are facing second is reliability uh, external shuffle service uh, is uh, basically depends upon the local uh, disk space and uh, many consecutor and then there is no um, then there is no uh, isolation of disk space or io so if there are many applications which goes and runs on top of it and one application is more chatty than other then uh, it will fill up the disk and mo most of the application which is running on the machines will fail so this this one this this is one of the major reliability concerns for us uh, from a from a shuffle service perspective and uh, from a, a compute engine perspective, we are migrating towards Kubernetes. So for Kubernetes dynamic allocation, we need an external shuffle service. Uh, the main, uh, the one of the main reason also is the co-location. So we wanted to um, co-locate state and stateless and batch workloads together on the same machine. Uh, for doing so, we need to remove IOs from the machine. And from removing IO, we need to remove shuffle data from the local machine by that stateless and batch can work together. So this is one of the other reason we wanted to also uh, is, is, uh, spend our time on something which can be solving all these issues. So we actually tried different approaches um, before we coming up with the uh, come up with the uh, uh, large, larger architecture. So one of the one of the things which we did is we actually ex extracted out the shuffle manager. And we wrote, and we actually plugged in a lot of uh, new, uh, lot of um, uh, external storage like NFS, HDFS, and we write through synchronous writes. Uh, the NFS was quite two x slow, HDFS was actually five x slow. Then we actually tried different approach. Uh, we tried to do some semi synchronous writes on the shuffle manager. Uh, what it does is it tries thread pools and try to write parallelly into different files. Uh, however, that also is not performant as we thought. So that was that experiment also 4x. So uh, what we tried is now we said, okay, these things are not working. So let's do streaming writes. Let's try streaming writes. So we wrote a shuffle service, a very uh, base version of shuffle service and see if the streaming writes will perform. So, and the backend we used HDFS in the first. So streaming writes from HDFS, it was like 1.5 times lower. Uh, which was better, but not at the same what we wanted. And then we tried streaming writes on the local disk, which had same performance, uh, similar performance of external shuffle service. Uh, we tried to change something, which I'll talk about in the next slides, uh, but uh, streaming writes on the local actually helped us. So in the remote shuffle service, what we actually uh, uh, zero down is uh, streaming writes on the local storage. However, we had to change many, many things to get to the similar performance. We actually changed the whole MapReduce paradigm, uh, how MapReduce today work. Um, so Mapper produce the output in each local machine and reduces gets from all the machines that get the data. So that has to be changed. And then we actually uh, streamline the whole process. So we record stream, will go to the shuffle service and directly go to the disk. So we're streaming to the disk directly which actually gave us a lot of performance improvements. And, and there is one more important thing that there is no spill now from the executor side, uh, which is uh, which was actually one of the ma main reason for slowness. So now because of there is no spill, uh, the performance is really better. So let's, uh, let's look at the um, uh, enlarge architecture, what is how remote shuffle service looks like. On the upper, uh, uh, upper side of the, uh, diagram, there is a host which is running executor, which has map task. And there is a shuffle manager, which is plugged into our remote shuffle service and which is being abstracted out from the shuffle manager from this path. So all what happens is this host will, these map tasks will know which partition they're writing to. So the map produce paradigm, what we change it to is all the map task will write for the same partition to the same remote shuffle server. So from, uh, there is a discovery is uh, there is server discovery where uh, we'll talk about it later, but the server discovery will know that for this partition, uh, for all the map tasks for this application will go to the same server. So all the mappers will write to the same shuffle server uh, 
uh, for the same partition. And those part and those data will be written uh, written sequentially. And then uh, reducer side, we will know that all for this partition, the data is in this particular remote shuffle server. And then the reducer side, those data will be uh, copied in from. So the reducer will go to one shuffle server and read the data sequentially. And it doesn't need to go to the all the machines. So this is the change in the paradigm where mappers writing for same partition to a machine and reducer only going to one machine. <clears throat> that actually improved us a lot of performance. Uh, and the shuffle server side, we have partitioners which actually go and partition the data into different files. Uh, and we'll talk about this into the next few slides. So let's talk about, uh, so let's do deep dive. Um, our uh, colleague, Bo, will now take it over and he will uh, go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Miak. Hey, uh, everyone, my name is Bo. So I work in the data infrastructure in Uber. So I will go through some details about how we design and implement the remote shuffle service uh, in our side. Yeah, we did a lot of experiments and uh, iterations. So we summarize our some design principle as followings. The first one is the scale out horizontally. Yeah, we know yes, Spark has many executors. We may have thousands of machines in the cluster. So we want to, uh, the whole system could scale out very easily. And uh, because we store data in the remote server and uh, for the network, the latency matters. It's not trivial, so we need to work around network latency using a lot of techniques. And at the same time, the network bandwidth is very high. So we don't focus on the bandwidth too much. We Instead, we focus on the latency a lot. And uh, also we do performance very seriously. We, we did a lot of performance optimization. And uh, we find uh, the major Spark applications succeed in our environment. So we focus on this application to optimize them for our uh, most cases. And uh, for failure cases, we, we rely on Spark and Yarn a retry to, to support the recovery. Okay, we will talk about uh, this in, in three, uh, three groups. The first one is scale out. Yeah, we achieve horizontal scalable by make each shuffle server work individually. They do not depend on each other. And uh, the whole cluster has hundreds of shuffle servers. So different applications can share different, uh, can share some shuffle servers and uh, they can also use different shuffle servers. It's pretty flexible. And because we don't have shared state among different shuffle servers, we can just add a new server without any bottleneck. And here is, is one example how we share, uh, how we put different shuffle server for a Spark application. And we know a Spark application has different mappers and reducers. Also its data has different partitions. These are all kinds of factors that we need to consider when we assign shuffle server to different uh, tasks. So in this example, we have three shuffle servers. While well, we have four mappers, and each mapper will connect to each shuffle server, because when the mapper send data to the shuffle server, the mapper have data for different partition, and the different partition reside on different shuffle servers. So basically, each mapper uh, will decide uh, based on the key which partition the data belongs to. Then the mapper will send data to that shuffle server which holds the partition. That's why each mapper will connect to uh, every shuffle server. Then for the reducer side, it's pretty simple because all the partition data reside on a single shuffle server. So the reducer only connects to that shuffle server and download the whole file directly. So we uh, simplify the reducer design a lot. So in next slide, we will give some generic uh, 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 calculation of how many network connections we, we, we have. And we use some numbers, for example, we have M mapper and uh, R reducer and uh, we have S servers. 
So the total connections in member side is M uh, multiple S connections. And for reducer side, it's R connections. So it's kind of uh, different from the Spark external shuffle service. In Spark external shuffle service, uh, the member side is kind of simple. It's right to the local. And uh, for reducer, it will connect to different uh, executor to read data. So there will be a lot of connections in the reducer side in, in the Spark external shuffle service. And here we kind of, in the map side we have more connection, in the reducer side we have less connections. But uh, the overall connection is kind of similar. Yeah, yeah now we will talk about uh, network latency. You know, we use NETI in the server side. As we know, NETI is a very high performance asynchronous server framework. So it can achieve very uh, high speed uh, when transferring data. And we use two thread groups in the server side. The first thread group is to accept the socket connection. The second thread group is to read the socket data and write to file. So they won't impact each other and they can uh, work in parallel. So this special design is uh, because when we do load test, we find sometimes if people, if there are a lot of applications writing a lot of data, it use up the second thread group a lot. And in our list design, we still have another thread group which can accept a new connection. So it can still running. And for network protocol, we use a binary network protocol designed by ourselves. We can achieve very high efficiency in coding. And also we can do compression uh, in, in our side. And uh, yeah, I think we will have to talk about that later with a little more details. Yeah. Yeah, when we write data to disk file, we write to the OS file directly. We do not do application level buffering. And in, in reality, this is, is very fast because OS has its own buffer. So we do not need another buffer. And we do zero copy. This is a common technique used by many servers. So we do that as well. So we transfer the data from the shuffle server to the reducer side without, without any uh, user level memory copy. And we, because we write and read data sequentially, there's no random disk IO, so it is very fast. Yeah, we mentioned uh, we use binary network protocols, so we do compression in the client side. So the shuffle client will compress and decompress data uh, it reduces the network size and also it reduces the CPU usage on the server side. So the server does not need to involve in the compression, deconversion, this kind of thing. And uh, also it's potentially will support client side encryption. So we do encryption from the client side and do decompression from client side as well. So the server side, again, does not need to involve. So it makes the whole system pretty secure. Another technique we use is uh, we parallel serialization at the network I.O. In Spark Shuffle, it will serialize data. Each shuffle record basically is a Java object. So it needs to be serialized to bytes. So it does serialization a lot. And the serialization takes time. So we use a, we decouple these two steps. We use a background thread to read the serialized data and send it to the server side so they can run side by side, don't block each other. It improves the performance in, in our production. You know, we also use connection pool. It, it's pretty simple, just reuse connection when possible. So this is common. We don't talk about that very much, yeah. Okay, so we do a very, uh, a very interesting optimizing our sites. I want to share that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do asynchronous shuffle data commit. So this is uh, coming from the observation we find. So for map task, when we st stream data to the server side, and the server side need to flash data to make it persistent. So the flashing takes time, and we don't want map task to wait for the flashing operation. 
So we again we decouple these two steps. Uh, two steps. So the map task will uh, tell the server side it finish sending data, and the server side will do the flash. We call it commit as well in the background. So the next map task do not need to wait for the previous map task to flash data. So this brings some issue in the reducer side because the reducer need to know, okay, all the data is flashed before it read data. So in the re reducer side, we do query data availability before it fetch data. So it asks the server, hey, whether the data is available. If it's available, it will get data to the server side. If not, it will wait a little bit and retry and fetch data again. Yeah, we also support for tolerance in our design. Yeah, the first thing we use Zookeeper as server rec recovery and uh, to health check. So it, it's pretty common, yeah. And we do data replica. For the mapper task, when it write data, it write to multiple server uh, at the same time. So if one server is done, it can still write data. For the reducer, because we have different replicas, the reducer just pick up one replica and read from that. Again, if one service is done, it will switch to another uh, replica. Yeah. And uh, the server side has some local state. Yeah, we measure we do not have centralized the shared state, but each shuffle server do have the local state. For example, it maintain the which map task is finished or is committed. So this kind of local state, uh, we do flash in batches. We try to avoid a small file flash again. So we do uh, we flash all this data in batches. So normally when shuffle stage is finished, we flash the state. So we we keep uh, our flash operation as minimum as possible. Yeah. Yeah, we will talk about some production status in our current environment. The first thing is uh, our whole remote travel service is compatible with open source Apache Spark. So you do not need to change anything when you, use, when you use it, or you do not need to change your internal Spark code to use it. Uh, it you can set the Shuffle Manager plugin to our remote shuffle manager class name, so it will just launch it through the plugin system. And in our side, we use the Spark map status and the map output tracker to, to maintain some state. For example, the shuffle server connection information. So we embed that in the map status so the reducer can retrieve that when it's uh, try to connect with servers. Yeah, we do a lot of metrics and Wuba has M3 open source metrics library, so we use that. And uh, we find uh, some very important metrics in our side is network connections, file descriptor, and uh, disk utilization. So we monitor these metrics very closely. Yeah, yeah we do a lot of tests to make it uh, production quality. So we do unit tests and also we do stress tests. So we, we have a special tool. It randomly generates data and run a uh, random map task, it will also random kill servers during runtime. So we can test a lot of edge cases. So this help us a lot to find a lot of issues. Also, we sample production hive queries and convert this query to Spark application. So we can get our real production load and test our system. Yeah, this is currently running our production. How much data we have, I think. The graph shows we may have around 500 terabytes uh, shuffling every day. So this is not whole uh, amount of data. Now we have even more data than this. It's running for eight months so far, and uh, so far everything is good. And uh, we have hundreds of thousand applications running every day. And uh, most importantly, we find the job latency is very similar with the Spark external shuffle. So we do not introduce any degradation for the server. And uh, also because we remove the spill files, so we actually reduce the file I/O dramatically by by half. Yeah, hopefully we will open source it very soon. 
Yeah, we still have a lot of work to do. Here's our roadmap. The first one is we want to support high bounce spark as well. And uh, yeah, we, we want to add a quota so it can run well in multi tenancy environment. Also, of course, load balancing is important. When you have more time, we can fine tune the load balancing. Also in Spark community, there's a discussion about new shuffle metadata API that is to support all kinds of different remote shuffle service. So when it's come out, we want to integrate with that as well. Yeah, that's all. So thank you everyone. And uh, if we have time, we can do Q&A.